Good morning. It's about time for us to begin this morning. I think most of you have probably heard our unfortunate news about Brother Hugh. Um, and uh, Sharon sent out a, a, uh, an update this morning. Um, they have that hip in traction until tomorrow. Uh, and surgery will be done tomorrow. So, um, but they also have six different hips to do uh, tomorrow. So, um, so they, she doesn't know where he is in line. So it, it will be sometime tomorrow, hopefully. But um, anyway, um, so that being said, you all get to listen to me. I don't know which is the more unfortunate uh, situation, Hughes or yours. <laughs> but uh, I think he would probably say his is. But uh, so what we're going to do, he actually did send me uh, his notes for First Peter. <laughs> but I don't like to whittle on Another, another man's end of the stick. So um, I, I'm just going to, we're going to save First Peter for when Hugh gets back. We're going to continue our study in the Synoptic Gospels, um, trying something a little different. I, we are recording this, um, but my phone does not have the option to connect to the microphone, so I'm recording it through my, through my earpiece, and so we'll see how the We'll see how the the, uh, the the volume comes out, and, and I can make some adjustments on that. So, as I told you Wednesday night, we, we were done with the parables for a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about miracles today. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of miracles that Jesus performed um, by the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and uh, um, so we'll, we'll uh, go from there, but uh, before we begin, if you'll please bow with me have a, a prayer first. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the day. We're thankful for all that you've given to us. Life itself, Father, we know that you're the giver of life uh, and that you hold life in the very palm of your hand. And we're so thankful that you've given us this gift. But more importantly, Father, we're thankful that you've given us the gift of eternal life through Jesus. Without him, we know, Father, that we would have no hope that we would be eternally uh, lost, eternally separated from you. But we're thankful that you loved us enough, and that you're so gracious and so, so merciful and so patient with your creation that you gave us Jesus, and you gave us that sacrifice, and that he was willing to make that sacrifice. We cannot thank you enough, Father. We thank you, Father, for the word that you have revealed, for showing us the life that Jesus lived uh, when he left heaven and took on flesh and, and talked and lived in such a way to give us an example. And so again, we thank you, Father, for all that uh, you have given to us. And we pray, Father, that as we study more about him this morning, as we see the great works that he did, that it will reinforce our faith in who he was and in who you are and the great power that you have to save. Please forgive us of our sins, Father. Please be with us. Bless us. Please especially, Father, be with Brother Hugh. Please uh, be with the doctors. Please help them to be able to help him so that he can get back to full strength, Father, as soon as possible. Please be with Ms. Sharon. Please uh, help us to help her and provide for her while he's away. And we pray, Father, that all will be done to your glory. And we pray that your will will be done in all things. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Okay, so, you know, I know that this is, um, we've gone over this several times, but I think it's, it's important to reinforce this. 
as much as possible. What we're seeing here, what we're going to see here with these miracles of Jesus is a common pattern. Um, Jesus would teach, and, and we've just seen him do a lot of teaching with the parables. Um, and then we would see miracles performed. And what is the reason then for the performing of the miracles to go along with the teaching? To prove the word. Um, you know, at that, at that time, they didn't have the revealed New Testament that we have. All, you know, they had the old law. That's, that's all that they had. And so there was no written word at that time. Um, and so in order to prove that the message that Jesus was was preaching was from God, the miracles were performed. But, you know, there's really another reason why Jesus performed the miracles. It wasn't just to prove the word, and I think that's the main part. But can you think of another reason why Jesus performed the miracles that he performed? Just to illustrate the extent of his power. Because if you think about the, uh, the, the, what we've seen so far, the, the things that Jesus has uh, shown power over, he's shown power over disease, he's shown power over the demons, he's shown power over animals. You know, when, when he told the, uh, Peter to let down the net and and uh, you know, the, 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 the net was full to breaking. Um, you know, he's shown, shown it over paralysis, over deformity, over mental and emotional problems, those who were in torments, it says, um, over distance uh, and pain when he, uh, he healed the centurion servant without me even being in the same room with him. He said, go your way, your servant is healed. And so, and, and we've seen him uh, exert power over death uh, with the healing or with the raising of the widow's son. And most importantly, we've seen his power over sin. Because remember the, the woman that came and anointed his feet and cried on his feet and washed his feet. What did he say to her? No, you're left. Your sins are forgiven. And so we said, you know, the, the miracles were not just to prove the word. Again, I, I think that's the main thing. But to show that Jesus had power, that Jesus was God. He was truly God with us. Uh, and so what we're going to look at this morning is a couple of uh, miracles, a couple of more miracles that Jesus performed. And the first one we're going to see is his power over the elements. So if you want to turn over to Mark chapter 8, um, and we're going to look at several verses here. Uh, in Mark chapter 8 and uh, verse 18, um, he says that when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. And so they were by the Sea of Galilee, and the multitudes were gathering, um, and, and you know, Jesus was feeling pressed here. So he said, let's get in the boat, let's go over to the other side of uh, the Sea of Galilee. And so we're going to stick down then into verse 23. Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fear fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Now you might have noticed that... Um, we kind of went backwards in Matthew because we had been in Matthew 13, Matthew 13 and 14, but we went back to Matthew chapter 8 uh, to look at this miracle. Um, so what, 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 
what, ha what has happened here is that this event is recorded earlier in Matthew, but in Mark, it comes later. Um, it comes after he teaches the parables. Um, so, you know, does that mean that there's a discrepancy in the Gospels? No. What we have to remember is that Mark or Matthew does not record things in chronological order. Um, and in, in fact, most of the Gospels are not recorded in chronological order. But what's important here is that we, you know, we see what is being what is being taught. So Jesus and his disciples then entered the boat. Storm blew up. And what Mark adds over in his account, we won't I'll go over there, but he adds that there were other boats also. Um, it wasn't just this one boat going across the Sea of Galilee, because remember, there was Jesus, and then there were 12, you know, at least, and then other disciples probably that, uh, that went, that were going across. So this storm didn't just affect the boat Jesus was in. There were several boats. Um, so, as, as they're going across the, the Sea of Galilee, then, and the storm blows up, what does Jesus do? He's sleeping. Okay. Now, why do you suppose Jesus was sleeping? He was tired. What had, what had Jesus been doing? He had been working. Uh, he had been teaching. He had been, you know... Uh, this was nonstop with the, the multitudes, and, and I have no doubt that, you know, it says there in Matthew chapter in, in verse 18 that he saw the multitudes pressing about him, and so he said, let's get in the boat and go across, because Jesus needed some rest. He was tired. Um, he was just like you and me. Um, now, there's a storm that blows up. Do you see any significance in the fact that Jesus was able to sleep in a boat in the middle of this huge storm? What's that? He doesn't have any sea sickness. He was really tired. He was really tired. He knew there was no problem. When the disciples wake him and say, we're perishing, what does he say? You little faith. You little faith. What does that tell us about Jesus' faith? That he was able to sleep on a boat during a storm. He had faith. He had faith that God was in control. He was in control. He had faith in God. And what does Jesus say numerous times throughout his ministry? My time has not yet come. And Jesus knew his time had not yet come. So, this is why he was able to sleep during a storm on a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. But his disciples, on the other hand, what was their reaction? Fear. Fear. They wake Jesus up and they say, Save us, Lord, for we are perishing. And it's interesting what Mark says in his account. When they wake Jesus up, they say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? How can you be asleep when we're about to die? It's interesting. It's pretty ironic. We're going to look at this in just a little while. How their tune changes from this verse to after he calms the storm. And we'll look at that in just a minute. And so Jesus, as he wakes... I want to read this again. Why are you fearful, O oh, you of little faith? He 
said you're fearful. And then he makes a connection there. Their fear proved that they had no faith. Why did their fear mark them as being a Right. Still didn't understand exactly what was going on. But do you remember that list that we went through at the beginning of class? All of the power that Jesus had shown so far over all of these different things. He had proven his power to them over and over and over again. Their faith still wasn't as strong as it needed to be. It's amazing that as much as they had seen, they were still still fearful when they were with Jesus. I can't explain that. Except that we have everything that God wanted us to know about the power of Jesus recorded in the New Testament. Do we ever get fearful? Do we ever have little faith? Definitely. So, what I'm saying is I'm not pointing fingers at them. <laughs> Unless if I am, I got three pointing right back at me because I have more than they had. And yet still sometimes I'm the same way. So how did Jesus call me to see them? <coughs> he spoke. He said he rebuked the winds and the waves and immediately <coughs> All he had to do was speak. Does that remind you of anything? How about Genesis chapter 1? And God said, Let there be light. And God said, Let there be a separation between the land and the water. That's how powerful our God is is that he has only to speak and things happen. It says he rebuked the winds and the waves. Who else did he rebuke? His disciples. In fact, I think it's Mark's account also that said he rebuked them, saying, O ye of little faith. Okay. But just like with all of the other miracles that we've seen so far, how complete was the calm? Utterly complete. Utterly calm on the Sea of Galilee when Jesus spoke. Just like with all of his other miracles, it's complete. And so then, remember what the disciples said, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Why are you asleep? What did they say when they saw what he did? Verse 27. Who can this be? That even the winds and the sea obey him. Who can this be? And again, this it, it amazes me. Okay, I'm not I'm not going to say again. I'm not pointing fingers here, but it amazes me that they are amazed by this after they had seen Jesus raise somebody from the dead. <laughs> I mean, in my human mind. Raising someone from the dead is so much more powerful 
than making the winds and the waves lie still. And yet, here they are, amazed. I would be amazed too. But, Jesus' miracle here just added to their amazement, added to their respect for Jesus. And so then, again, I've got, to, I've got to go back to where we began at the, at, at, at the first this morning. The reason for the miracles. The reason for the miracles was to prove Jesus' power, or to show him the extent of his power, but more so to prove that his teachings were from God. So as they saw this, and they had been hearing Jesus teach, how much more must this have reinforced his teachings in their minds when they saw him do this? When you read the word, and then you read that, the word accompanied by the miracles that Jesus performed, what does that do for your trust in the word? It can't help but reinforce it. And I, that did this did the same thing for the disciples. And so we just we have a, a, a an example here of Jesus' power over the elements, but more so the reinforcement of the words that he had spoken in the minds of his disciples and in our minds as well. Anything you want to add or any any comments, questions? Before we before we move on. Okay. Well, let's talk let's talk about then Jesus' power over demons. We've already seen Jesus' power over demons, um, but this is another example, and, and to me, this one this one always kind of scared me a little bit. <laughs> I mean, this is a scary this is a scary situation when you think about it what these demons were doing to these men and to, in this region, um, how fearful the people must have been um, of, over this situation. So let's read it. Matthew chapter 8. I'm going to begin in verse 28. When he had come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men, coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a good way off from them there was a herd of many swine feeding. So the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. So when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Then those who kept them fled, and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. Okay, so this, this occurs right after the calming of the storm. And Jesus has come across the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and so he, he came to the other side, it says there in verse 28, to the uh, country of the Gergesenes. Okay, now, your version may, be, may say something different. I've got the gatherings up there. Some versions say that gathering, some say Gerasenes, some say Gergesenes. Okay. Well, the reason for that is because in this area where Jesus was, there were three cities. Gergesa, Gadara, and Gerasa. So, the Gergesenes, the Gatherings, and the Gerasenes. So that's why the, the difference in the in the different names, depending on the translation that you're reading, um, you know, and depending on you know who was writing here. So 
uh, that's you know that's enough about that. But what do we know about these men? Oh, there's a lot of information here that we're told about these men and what these demons were doing to them. So what do we know? And how many really were there? Matthew says there were two. Mark and Luke says, only talks about one. The same same event. We got two and we got one. So which was it? I believe there were two. But in uh, Mark and Luke, I think what we see is that Jesus most likely spoke to the fiercer of the two. Okay. But there were two men here who were possessed by demons. And where did they live? In the cemetery, among the tombs. They were living among the tombs. Okay? And I think one of the verses said they were living in the tombs. And what, how did they act? It was very violent. Very violent. It says that they attacked any who passed by on the road. Mark and Luke also tell us that they had even tried to bind these men with chains and the demons were so strong that they broke the chains. Also, Mark and Luke tell us that they had guard, they had, the people had placed guards around these men to try to guard them, but none could subdue them. And Mark and Luke also tell us that they were naked, that they cried night and day and cut themselves with stones. Boy, how would you like to live next door to the cemetery with this going on? Wow. See, I see when I say this is pretty frightening, pretty scary to think of what was going on. And how many demons were they possessed by? Legions. Legion. Mark and Luke again. Um, Jesus asks them, what is your name? And they said, Legion, for we are many. Terrifying. There's no horror movie that anybody can make today that I think we compare with what these men were going through. So that's what we know about the men and how the demons were affecting them. But what do we learn about the demons? They knew Jesus. They recognized Jesus as the Son of God. And they were afraid of Jesus. And they were afraid of Jesus. Because they recognized his power. They recognized his power. James 2.19 said, The demons believe truth. So all of the demons knew Jesus. How did they how did these demons identify Jesus? So they recognized Jesus as the Son of God. They recognized that he had power over them. They wanted to be left alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus, Son of God? Do you know what else they knew? Look at... <coughs> Look at the very last sentence of verse 29. Time. Have you come to torment us before the time? What did these demons know? They had the power to punish them, and they knew that 
time was coming that they would be judged. There was there is a there is a judgment coming. Um, look, uh, turn over a couple of uh, chapter, a few chapters to Matthew chapter twenty-five and verse forty-one. Matthew twenty-five and verse forty-one. Now, this is not talking specifically about the demons, but this is talking about judgment. He will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you curse into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil. And who? His angel. And who are the devil's angels? The demons. Okay. They're the devil's messengers. They were the devil, devil's workers. Okay. Um, so... 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. I just want to kind of drive this point home, but uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 2 and verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And then over in Jude. Jude verse 6. The angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. This judgment was no secret to the demons. So they were, they were living it out while they could because they knew judgment. Come. And so they had, they knew Jesus had the power to condemn them to hell. We're gonna come back to that hopefully in just a few minutes. So then what did whoops what did the demons request? Yeah, send us into the herd of swine. Because they wanted they want to continue to have some bodies to inhabit. So, why did Jesus grant their request? It wasn't time for their judgment yet. What did it do for these two men? It healed them, it freed them. It freed two precious souls who had been in torments. And is it, wouldn't, isn't it better to send these demons into some animals rather than to just cast them out and allow them to find more human victims? Now, I've always wondered after the swine killed themselves what happened to the demons after that. But well, we're not told that. So that's a question secret things belong to the Lord. <laughs> okay. But how did the people, then how did the people in the region respond? And I want to break this up three ways. How did the herdsmen, the one who were taking care of the pigs, how did they respond to what happened? They went and told everybody. They said that they fled. <laughs> they ran away and they ran into the city and told everybody. So they were fearful. It scared them. But they also reported everything that they had seen, including what had happened to the two men. So then after they reported it, how did the city react? They came to see. They came out to see Jesus. So, you know, there's this, at least this little glimmer of hope there that they would come out to see. But when they came out to see, what did they do? They asked Jesus to leave. <coughs> Why? Why do you think they asked Jesus to leave? Well, and this is just my this is just my thing, so. But I think it was fear. You know, in spite of their material loss, they, and, and great spiritual gain had been made, they were fearful. 
It's almost like they're saying, and I've done an invitation on this before, it's almost like they're saying, we'd rather still have our babies. You know, we'd, we'd, rather, we'd rather still have those babies. So, yeah. But isn't it also possible that fear that he's going to see their faults? Yeah, true. Yeah. And, you know, they've seen what he's done with their kids, and they're thinking, okay, if we have no more kids, mm-hmm. what's that going to do to us? Right, right. Yeah, so just kind of fear of the unknown, you know, fear of, of what might happen now. And so then, how did the men, we're, we're not told in Matthew's account how the men responded, these two men who had been demon-possessed. What did, how did they react? They wanted to go with Jesus. They were excited. Please let us go with you. Jesus said no. Why? What had the people done to Jesus? They had rejected him. What did Jesus need in that area? He needed someone to continue to tell the good news about what it happened. Because he talk, tells these men, you stay here and go and tell all that has happened to you. So Jesus, Jesus was a smart man. He said, I can't stay here because they have asked me to leave. But you stay here and you tell them. And so it says that they did, and they, they went all around the region of the capitalist, which was a, a region where there were ten cities, there, thus, you know, that does ten. Okay? So the capitalists, they went around telling the good news of what had happened. Yes, ma'am. Were these people Jews? I was, I was, I why they were raising pigs. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I assume they were because Jesus, you know, he went to the Jews first. And so I, I have to assume that they were. And, and I guess they were, you know, they were raising pigs because they were probably selling them to the Gentiles. You know, it's a way to make money. So um, they couldn't, you know, eat them or whatever, but they could certainly sell them to those who could. So that's the only thing I can do. Well, I think there are several lessons that, that I want to I really briefly run through as, as we wrap things up this morning about what we see here. And the first lesson is, you know, sometimes fear of the unknown is often greater than fear of the known. You know, here we have fear of the demons versus fear of Jesus. Because they asked Jesus to leave after he had exerted his power over the demon, yet they asked him to leave. And, you know, you think about what we see in our world today. That many today are under the power of Satan, not because of demon possession, but just because of, you know, world things. They're under the power of Satan, but they're more afraid to come out of that life and serve Jesus than they are to remain in that situation. So sometimes fear of the unknown can be greater than fear of the known. And another lesson here is that sometimes we can do the greatest good where we are and with what we have. These men wanted to go with Jesus. They wanted to be part of Jesus' ministry. Being with Jesus, being with the disciples. But Jesus said, No, I need you back. I need you to stay where you are. You're going to do the greatest good for me where you are. And so the lesson for us is you know, sometimes we we look at, Oh, we want to do great things. So, you know, we go over there and do great things. We can. You know, do this and do that over here and over there and everywhere. And we'll neglect our own path. That's not 
can't convince her. All people have known you all the time. Right. You go somewhere else, you have a better shot. Yeah. Yeah. You're not knowing you, but you think you're just you. Right. Right. <laughs> so, again, sometimes, you know, we just need to look for the needs in our own backyard. It doesn't take some great need to bring others to Christ. Um, and then thirdly, you know, the, the lesson is that Jesus has all authority. Jesus is in control, and he needs to be treated accordingly. The demons acknowledged Jesus. And in fact, I think it's Mark and Luke's account that says when, the de- when Jesus appeared before these men, the demons knelt Jesus. They put these men on their knees before Jesus because they knew who he was. And they entreated him. They didn't demand anything of Jesus. They didn't ask for their rights from Jesus. But they entreated him. They begged him. And what's sad? And you all have seen this, I'm sure. Is that many people today treat Jesus worse than the demons do. Taking his name in vain, making jokes about him. But What's really sad is that I think a, a big reason why people act like that is because they know less about Jesus than they see this day. And they talk about who Jesus is and what Jesus is. They know maybe some all things that they've heard, but they don't know the truth. And so again, that's where we come in. Remember taking care of things in your own backyard? Maybe people would not treat Jesus the way they do if they knew more about it. They knew what these demons do. So, food for thought, and we are out of time. And, uh, we don't have anybody to ring the buzzer, so I hope Ben's got that. I hope they've got their I'll go ring the buzzer. But thank you all so much for your attention and your participation. <laughs>